three words that are so hard to say. I was wrong. So what was I so wrong about? Basically, my major statement, I was thinking about the current structure, which many people do, right? So we have Power 5 conferences and we have Group 5 conferences, and they all have TV contracts associated with that, but they also have all kinds of factors as to why and how they're playing at the level that they're playing. And I really surfaced the notion that um, there are a lot more factors than just TV broadcasting, uh, TV media deals that were important to the shift in college football. And while some of those things still remain true, I underestimated really what was going on. Not only the power of what a TV broadcast media contract means, but also the impetus for it. Typically change comes as a disruptor. And it's not just the evolution to the current structure. So I was listening to this, I don't know if it's a podcast or radio radio thing, but I saw it on YouTube. Is it Steve Jones? Yeah, Steve Jones from State College, PA, and there in the Happy Valley for Penn State. I was interviewing a guy named Tony Knopp, who I think is a ticket sales executive or something. He kind of had the inside news from USC as to why they made this big switch to the Big Ten. And obviously they'd been maybe unhappy with Pac-12 over the years because they felt like they were kind of driving most of the eyeballs and the dollars and all that stuff and teams like Washington State were you know kind of benefiting of that but hey that was the whole point of a conference anyway. Uh, in any case um, USC felt like they were at the next level and, and that they wanted to kind of, kind of maybe break off a little bit maybe even be independent but in order to do that, a lot of things had to change. It wasn't just a notion of switching between the conferences as they exist in the structure. There's also this notion of there's a bunch of teams with huge budgets and a bunch of teams with small budgets. And how do you uh, compensate people fairly for that investment, that engagement, and, and that level of play, as well as um, giving people a chance to rise? And the template that was mentioned was the template of the English Premier Soccer League, the pyramid structure of promotion and relegation. So the first thing that they brought up was the notion of who's driving the change. Right now, there are some schools who definitely want to be among the elite schools, and they feel that they want to play maybe in a higher league. But it's not really just the schools or the conferences that are creating this reach. But it's actually really about the TV networks themselves. They are looking at their own survival. They're looking at their markets and recognizing that actually live TV is kind of dead. Like there's not a lot of things to broadcast that are live that are really interesting and, and, and repeatable, right, that come around every year. So sports is it. Live sports is driving the money revenues for TV broadcasters. I mean, look at what happened at the Oscars. Like, has anybody watched the Oscars for the last 10 years other than to watch Will Smith smack Chris Rock across the face? I mean, and is anybody going to watch the Oscars next year? I don't think so. I mean, I remember having Oscar watching parties, but that's kind of in the past, you know. Um, I'm not really sure what other live broadcasts there are. Maybe 24-7 news, but people are sick of that too. I think sports really is the most most intriguing thing that could further or could engage and really drive business for broadcasters. So why is college football important? Well, of course it's a sport, but I think it's one of the most lucrative sports from a media contract it goes. Um, you know, there's a few, few reasons that I think are interesting. The first one is that, you know, sports is, they just, the drama of live, non-scripted, live competition that's non-scripted is, um, is really compelling. You know, if you look at all the shows that we've got on Netflix and Hulu and everything, all scripted, all kind of predictable, you know, but uh, the notion that anything could happen at any time is, is kind of intriguing for all of us. And I think the second bullet point is really one of the most important is that people have an irrational affinity for their team and it's driven by all kinds of things. They went to school there, they live there, their communities invested in the university there. We love screaming our head off for no apparent reason with 110,000 other people who are dressed in the same ugly orange and white. And that's, that's really powerful because it's an experience brand. You could live it every day and there's a lot of uh, spending power there. You know, in my last 
video on this, I mentioned that there are generations that maybe don't have the same affinity towards college football as some of the others, like Gen X and Boomers and things like that. Millennials are still kind of into it, but not quite Gen Z. And these are the prime spending years for those generations, Boomers, Gen Xers, Millennials. They're going to have the most money in the next 10 years, right? So they better capitalize on this moment. This is college football's prime moment from a broadcasting standpoint. And then the last part is kind of a little bit more of like the idea that it's, a, and it's an experience event. I mean, if, it, if you played football at all, if you played any sport at all, you really have a good appreciation for what these athletes are doing. It's really exciting to be able to watch somebody jump into the air and grab a football out of the air, you know, and, or, you know, dance, dance down the out of bounds line to make it into the end zone. Uh, I think people have an appreciation for that if, if they've engaged in any kind of physical activity at all. So for those factors, I think college football is highly lucrative, even compared to other, all kinds of other broadcast sports and, and live broadcasts that they could, they could make. Um, and so college football is really important to the broadcasters, not just the schools, but the broadcasters. So Tony Knopp addresses this notion, and he says, look, there's actually a template for this. There's a template for the survival of these businesses and also for the schools that have a lot of invested and giving a chance to those who are not so well invested as well. And um, it's the English Premier League Soccer League. Uh, this is exactly what was done in the 90s. Um, so Sky Sports came in in 1991, and they kind of set up this notion of the pyramid promotion and relegation level organization for the soccer league. So the pyramid level promotion and relegation of top tier teams with bottom tier teams sort of climbing up the ladder. And this was actually created by the sports broadcasting uh, network uh, Sky Sports. I mean, if you think about this, this is exactly the notion of what a Super League might be, right? So the Big Ten and the SEC are kind of positioning themselves as the Super Leagues. And then you have the other, the other teams able to follow suit, right? What Tony Knott brought up was, hey, look, in 91, hey, look at that, 26 live matches on TV, nine and a half on the BBC, and only 27 free free games being, being broadcast. And then... When Sky Sports started their thing here, look at what they're doing now. Now, this is 15 years later, or 15, well, 25 years later, but they've got almost 300 league games, even with like uh, 126 Premier and 127 Football League games, almost 300 games being premiered all the time or being broadcast all the time. They've got basically 24 7 coverage, a lot of it's subscriber based, you know, payment structures. And because they have this 24-7 broadcast, they can elevate even more sports, rugby, boxing, cricket, all that kind of stuff. So basically, I mean, this is a business model that works, right? And that's where the broadcasters are looking at. So, of course, they're going to look at this Premier League. Uh, so the top tier Power 5 teams break off and become Super Leagues, right? And then, you know, you can have your group of fives or, or whatever it is kind of, you know, promote themselves up as they get better. Um, I think that fixes one of the notions that, you know, there are these teams like USC who felt like they were carrying the load for like Washington State and, and stuff like that. And uh, that allows them to have a tiered structure of compensation as well, right? So let's take a look at that model. What would it look like in college football? There it is. The Super Leagues are basically the Big Ten and the SEC. They've got the media broadcast uh, contracts, right? And then a second tier might be the power players. Now, I'm sure people look at this slide and they just lose their mind because, well, of course the Big 12's in the power five, but this is really based on the notion of the value of those TV, TV media broadcast contracts, right? So throw out everything else I said before and focus just on those broadcasting, and, and this is exactly what you've got. This is the future of college football, right? So you basically have two Super Leagues, and they're the Premier League. They're the equivalent of the Premier League, and it's Fox Sports and ESPN who are driving that. 
and then you have the power players who have lucrative contracts who 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 you know they're good teams and they have a lot of eyeballs but they're they don't have the same buying power as those big media contracts as well big 12 acc um, and you know here we go here's here's what happens is the the de facto is that basically the pac 12 is dead if we've got usc and ucla going to the big 10 it's been rumored that washington and oregon is now going to go and maybe cal and stanford so they're out and then it's been rumored that arizona utah colorado all those schools maybe head to the big 12 who you got left you got uh you know oregon state and washington state who probably end up merging with the mountain west because it looks like it fits probably have some media rights there and then you know uh, you might, in in here, these are made up leagues, right? You got the Super League, you got the Power Players. Um, this would be controversial. I'm sure people are losing their mind with this slide here, where I've got the Sun Belt and the Power Player. But you know, I, I watched another video. I think it was the uh, the guys over at Sikkim 365, uh, the fellas over in Waco. They had the commissioner of the Sun Belt on there, and he said, "Yeah, we might think about you know." expanding to 20 teams as well and they've got their own contract with espn to to that they've established you know i don't know the contract with the american but i'd have i'd be hard pressed to say it's any better or worse than what the sunbelt's got going on and sunbelt arguably might have better competition uh in the new in the new realignment right because if you look at all the teams that are in the new american they're basically conference usa from old and uh, the Sun Belt did a great job in this last round of realignment to to regionalize, right? They recognized that the school that they had, the schools that they have, are playing quality football, but you know they're maybe smaller budgets, and they so they really kind of focused on the core of the Southeast, where you've got fans able to drive the games and really be invested as a community in those teams, and you know. At this point, it's really all about TV revenue. So if, if they can build that league and build the support for that league, they're going to get a better TV contract. So, And then that my third tier is I call them the contenders, right? So it's whoever doesn't have the greatest TV uh, contract, right? Conference USA, MAC, and uh, it could be the American, could be the Sun Belt, could be the Mountain West. I, I don't really know what that looks like. And then, of course, the FCS. Now, the cool thing about this whole idea is that I, I forgot to mention is that uh, we just heard that the college football playoffs is going to expand to 12 to 24, and that fits exactly the template of the Premier League, English Premier Soccer League, right? So uh, you have this playoff structure so that you can create a promotion level or a demotion relegation level action within FBS football. And then FCS football can literally now fit into that structure. So maybe you have some teams who are national championships in FCS coming up to FBS even easier, right? They're just more of the base of that pyramid. One of the reasons that this premier soccer league pyramid promotion level works is because it helps the communities who have a team support that that area as a community, and that fits right into college football, right? We have built-in alumni networks that are supporting college football, and that's effectively what happens over in English soccer, at least English football leagues, is that you've got these communities who are focused on investing in the soccer team because as they get promoted, then that gives cachet and pride to the community. And we have that built right into the college football system. So here's what they all look like. Here's what the maps look like now. Right, so here's uh, the American. I've got the ACC with Notre Dame added. Right, talked about that. Here's the Big Ten, or at least what's been proposed over the last five days for the Big Ten: UCLA, USC, uh, Cal, Stanford, Oregon, and, and Washington added. Right, so it's coast to coast, but that's all based on TV market and where teams. And then there's the new Big Twelve with the other four schools added, and that really rounds that out. You know that. They may be able to renegotiate a, high, a higher and a better contract. Maybe they're maybe the Big Twelve becomes its own Super League. Well, that would really suck for uh, Texas and Oklahoma to leave, <laughs> and then kind of do that. But uh, sweet justice for the Kansases of the world, right? Um, Conference USA, no change there for the future. 
and here's the independence. I've got the Mac. Here's the new Mountain West, and let's say goodbye and have a nice sayonara to the Pac-12 with uh, Washington State and Oregon State up there. Nobody really wants to see Washington State, Oregon State get kind of screwed and have to go to the Mountain West, but look, look at, I think that's pretty fair competition, to be honest with you. Uh, I think that might be an exciting league with those. And then we've got the Sun Belt. As I mentioned, they did a bang-up job of really regionalizing themselves and getting schools that are really interested in, in elevating their game. And, and, and uh, here we go. Here's our Super League. So this is the Pac-12 and the, no, Pac-12, sorry. This is the Big Ten and the SEC together. This is the Super League of 2025. I'm sure there's people who would be like, oh, no, you got to throw the Big 12 in there. But we'll see what happens. And then here's the power players, you know, the Big 12, and you've got uh, – bunch of players from the old Pac-12, and I threw the Mountain West in here. You know, that's debatable. It could be the American, could be the Mountain West. ACC, of course, you know, Clems you want the Clemsons of the world to be in the Super League, but um, again, you know, this is the one fun thing about this is the notion of what the Super League is could totally be different than what I just suggested here, right? Uh, Cal and Stanford could totally take a back seat, you know, in sports, they kind of have taken a back seat. And instead of having Cal and Stanford in the Super League, maybe you have Clemson and, I don't know, one of the other ACC schools, Florida State maybe, you know. Uh, but the notion of geography uh, for top-tier schools that have enough money is, um, is kind of gone. And then uh, here's the contenders, right? So we've got the MAC and CUSA. So... Quick recap on the things that I was right on, things I was wrong on. Well, the first one is that the NCAA doesn't mean anything. It's a lame duck organization. In fact, the NCAA really had to take a back seat if any of this were going to happen. It makes me think about it almost as a conspiracy theory. If ESPN and Fox Sports are really as powerful as we think they are, they they could have bought some folks up. I don't know. I'm not going to make any like accusations or anything, but... It's hard to believe that all of the timing of these things all happened just, you know, sort of ser serendipitously, right? I I'm sure there are people in the background working around their thing. Uh, the one thing I got wrong was the power play uh, of the – well, I got it right. I knew there was going to be power play for, for power five, but I didn't really understand what a Super League might look like. Um, again, the NIL had to kind of happen for all – as a catalyst for this notion of a Super League to come about. Uh, the one thing I 100% got wrong was the value of the TV broadcast. You know, I tried to think about um, streaming networks and technology as uh, something that was valuable to lower conferences, but it's really not as valuable as these TV contracts, because they're driving the change in the structure. You know, the one thing I'm going to say that's kind of equal is the future of education in colleges. You know, the, this whole notion of, of uh, amateur play and universities and how they're affiliated, I don't know how that's all going to play out, but uh, I think it's all changing for sure. I, I don't know what the impact of new professional leagues are. Uh, we'll see over the next 10 years if the smaller crowds and changing interest changes things, right? But I think, again, one thing that I did get wrong, maybe that I should change that yellow for the smaller crowds to, to an X, is that, you know, really, we, we got to double down. The next 10 years are really important to these broadcasts because the crowds who really love college football are in their prime spending years. The one thing I got wrong was just really the importance of the broadcast. But again, you know, I really just, I didn't see the notion that this is about survival for the the TV broadcasters, not just for the greed and expansion of the Big Ten and the SEC. And I, again, I don't know if this is serendipitous or if this was brokered. I mean, you kind of have to think that shifts this big have to be brokered. Here it is. We've only just begun. If we come to the notion of a pyramid structure of promotion and relegation, we are basically in for constant conference realignment every year as a part of the actual play of the structure of the game. And uh, so that's, we've only just begun and that's the way the cookie crumbles folks. So let's enjoy this year, which has been awesome by the way, the Kansases of the world, the app states of the world are making everybody rethink 
what they think they know about college football, and we're enjoying it. Once again, please, want to hear your comments. would love to learn what you guys know about things, and I'm sure a few of these slides uh, probably uh, ruffled the fever feathers of a few of you fans out there, but, you know, bring your comments. Let's talk about it. I want to hear uh, what, what are the things I missed this time, or what are the things that we didn't consider just yet, or what are the things we're going to need double down for in the future? Anyways, thanks a lot. We'll, we'll see you guys soon.